Bueno, pues me toca, aunque un poco tarde, ¿no? No sé cómo. It's my turn. It's getting late in the morning. Let me start by saying that I'm thrilled to be here uh, to tell you about uh, our work. Thank you for this opportunity. I was asked to tell you about uh, now San Juan, and I thought, hmm, let's not talk about technology, uh, because other presentations will be dealing with that side of things. So I decided to tell you how and why we are working on now San Juan. The San Juan is a very well-known wreck. We're in charge of a scientific dossier that uh, is available uh, free of charge. Uh, so, uh, anybody who wants to know about technological details uh, in the San Juan, uh, they can just come and visit us in Albaola. So, uh, I would also like to tell you uh, about my own personal experience uh, in the San Juan. Project. Let me tell you about myself. Well, I've been living in Pasaya for many years, uh, but I'm actually originally from San Sebastian, from here. And uh, I love the city. Uh, I love San Sebastian. I was always attracted uh, to San Sebastian Port, to that area, that part of the city, since I was a, a, a little child. Uh, well, things have changed a lot uh, since I was a child in the port. Uh, the, we don't see fishing boats anymore. Uh, so, uh, San Sebastian port uh, is completely different now from my memory. Uh, my memories of the port in San Sebastian uh, are very similar to what we can find still now in other parts of the world. And uh, I, I found it, found it uh, so appealing, so amazing. This is what it used to look like. This picture is about 45 years old. And you can see uh, wooden vessels, except for the Ciudad de San Sebastián, uh, that was the tourist ship which has disappeared since then. So, uh, this was the last uh, link on the chain of uh, this part of San Sebastian port. Uh, when I was a child, some of my friends would love trains. Well, I didn't. I loved boats and the, this particular type of boat. Small boats uh, that nobody else seemed to be very keen on. I must tell you, uh, I found... Uh, I found it so sad uh, that uh, these wooden boats uh, just disappeared. Can you imagine, 500 years ago, a group of people uh, in the woods near Ondarroa choosing the best oak trees and just with a few uh, tree nails and uh, iron nails, they would build a boat and go around the world. Amazing. Uh, that was the way uh, humans had at that time to connect with the rest of the world, and some of our four runners did it really well, and that's part of the Basque heritage. So, uh, that was my feeling as a child, and uh, this is what we have now. So, uh, no wooden boats anymore. In fact, I heard that uh, the last uh, group of craftsmen who really knew about shipbuilding in wood, uh, well, they, they stopped uh, getting trainees uh, to work with them, and I thought, well, that was the time when I had to learn how to do it from them. 
And at that time, what was my motivation? Uh, I decided to learn about wooden wood wood shipbuilding at a time when nobody else was interested in it, so I wasn't motivated by thinking that I would make a living with that. Uh, I, I, w I had uh, a taste for history. I knew that uh, some of our forerunners uh, had been whaling uh, near Canada, for instance. Uh, I knew about Elcano's circumnavigation voyage. But, uh, I don't know. Uh, I was uh, just very, very keen. Uh, in this field, on this field. At that time, not many people knew about what Elcano had done, and I think that's probably the case still now. Uh, we're sometimes told about uh, details uh, by academia, but sometimes uh, the more basic uh, concepts uh, are not explained. Concepts that have to do, for instance, with our identity. As a youngster, uh, I was told uh, that the Basque country had always been a pretty poor territory uh, where people had emigrated because of that, uh, with too many shepherds. That's part of your fault, by the way. No, it's a joke. You've done fantastic work with that. And then Barandi uh, Aran uh, and uh, the famous anthropologists uh, had done very well at explaining our culture and heritage, uh, but more about the rural environment, about the land, but what about the sea and shipping? We, we, we were told about nothing uh, connected with that. Well, we're very fortunate uh, to be here yesterday and today listening to the best experts uh, from around the world. And uh, we hear now that uh, we were not particularly poor. We were not just isolated and lost in the woods. As Rubbish, he said. It was the complete opposite, right? Uh, the Basque country has been for many centuries very wealthy, uh, a true capitalist territory, and a large part of that uh, wealth uh, came from the sea and our maritime culture. And yet, that message is not often told. Uh, we're told about Olencero, the Basque Father Christmas, and uh, all those iconic figures and messages, which is fine and good. But, uh, hey, let's not forget uh, what things were really like. For instance, listening to Brad Lowen, fortunately, bumped into him many years ago. And thanks to him, uh, our association is called Albaula. Uh, almost 30 years ago, Brad uh, got in touch. Uh, he was interested in a number of things uh, about the Basque country. And somebody asked me, uh, what is an Albaula? Uh, I don't know if I have a drawing of an Albaula here with me. Well, it's a, a carpentry part that was replaced uh, back in history, and uh, at that time that name uh, went fuzzy, uh, it kind of disappeared. And uh, it's funny how sometimes we have to wait for a foreign, foreigner. Well, sorry, Miren. No, not just ah, foreigners. Ah, <laughs> You're not a foreigner, right? Eso es, sí, eso es. Sí, Brad hizo eso exactamente. Yes, you are right. Uh, Brad came and uh, met us uh, all those years ago and told us about those terms and words uh, that uh, had almost disappeared as if they were fossil, fossils. So, thanks to Huxley, uh, the British expert, uh, and Canada, we learned about San Juan as being the ship, the starship uh, in, eight, in 16th century 
wrecks. And I remember uh, the time when I first heard about San Juan. Uh, in Pasaya, nobody knew about San Juan, even though it had been on the front cover of the National Geographic. Amazing, right? Uh, the starship. Uh, together with Toby Jones's um, Cardiff uh, medieval ship, San Juan. Uh, we, we, we had no idea. We knew nothing about it. Between Newport and San Juan, uh, we have now Victoria and uh, Juan Sebastián Elcano. And again, uh, Elcano, uh, how can people say that uh, we were a poor people uh, who knew about nothing? If you read uh, most history books, uh, they say that Basque uh, whaling and shipbuilding is something we learned from the Vikings. Well, that's what uh, history books used to say up until very, very recently. So, who uh, told that lie? Well, partly we did, uh, and uh, people outside the Basque country. And who was Elcano? Well, he was a pain in the neck, right? Why was he a pain in the neck? Because he was Basque, uh, and that's, that's bad news, uh, both in the Basque country and outside the Basque country. For instance, Arguía, the journal uh, that will soon be one century old. Arguía, the journal, uh, proposed uh, Elcano as a criminal. Well, asked if Elcano was, in fact, a criminal. I find that terribly insulting. What a load of rubbish again. So, once again, let me tell you about Albaola. Uh, our association was set up 21 years ago because we wanted uh, to turn all of that terrible situation over its head. We now have polyester filling our ports and harbors, uh, breaking uh, our Basque beautiful chain that we had up until very recently. And then in 1985, uh, this issue of National Geographic was published. At that time, uh, I was a student uh, in the US to learn about riverside carpentry. Can you imagine having to go all the way to the US to learn about shipbuilding in, in wood? And that's how I learned about uh, this uh, front cover. I was uh, improving my English, uh, and somebody came me kindly and said, you might be interested in this, uh, National Geographic talking about uh, Robert Grenier, uh, the diver, uh, and about uh, this ship, this uh, whaling ship. Well, that this was the eye-opener for me. That's when I really understood uh, that uh, reality can be better than fiction. And that was the beginning of my true dream. Uh, remember, I was only a young man uh, in my American adventure at that time. Uh, and I thought, well, uh, why not? Uh, one day, uh, we might be able to reconstruct uh, San Juan, the star in the recovery of the San Juan. So why are we reconstructing the San Juan? Well, I think because we want to reconstruct ourselves or our people. Uh, thanks to the amazing gift uh, we got from Canadians, and yesterday during the guided tour, m most of you were there, and I told you how uh, I've seen uh, wrecks like the San Juan uh, being destroyed. 
during building work, for instance, uh, totally discarded as if they were completely useless. I'm not going to tell you where, but I remember uh, getting uh, this piece of wood from a wreck and I took it with me uh, to uh, the city hall and just left it uh, on the mayor's desk. And he said, well, sorry, this has nothing to do with me, this has to do with the coastal authorities. And I thought, wow, what an answer. And that was it. That's why we're holding this event yesterday and today, because uh, these fantastic speakers, uh, many of them coming from abroad, uh, are reminding us about the landmarks in underwater archaeology, uh, which are, of, uh, are often uh, much more amazing than architecture and archaeology on land. Uh, let's not forget that ships were uh, the uh, technological structures uh, of their time. Uh, they had to face that huge challenge. Can you imagine uh, what Elcano did? He changed the world. He changed uh, our concept of universal geography. He was the first human being uh, that uh, managed to put the continents all together on a piece of paper uh, with the seas and oceans, uh, everything, with everything making sense. It's an extraordinary feat and we cannot possibly afford uh, to uh, talk about Elcano as a hero uh, and to even wonder or propose uh, that he might be a criminal. Why? Because he was a Basque. So, uh, let's, let me remind you that uh, now is the time for cultural revolution. Up until very recently, uh, very few of us cared, uh, but now uh, mostly foreigners have reminded us that uh, Basque people uh, was not uh, poor, uh, that the Basque people uh, was very well connected with the world, very knowledgeable at a time like the late Middle Ages or the Renaissance period. We need this revolution now. And I don't like criticizing people, but in Seville now uh, there is uh, this promotion of Magellanic cities. Proposing that uh, Magellan, well, Magellan was very important. He was the one who found the connection between the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. That was a true uh, landmark. He was the leader of the expedition who went across the Pacific as an amazing feat, and then that was it. He died in the Philippines, right? So let's not continue to uh, think that uh, Elcano's feat uh, is due to Magellan, which is what's being done to a certain extent. Uh, public funding uh, continuing to be a curtain that hide uh, the relevance, Elcano's relevance. And how can we achieve that? Well, uh, if we all work together, if we all row in the right direction. Sorry, I'm completely forgetting about my presentation. Oh dear, let's go back to it. So, we were told that the Basque country uh, had no history, no marine history, and uh, Jesus Marie Perona, uh, who's not here today, I don't think, but I just want to remind you that uh, he's uh, been key to these dentals. Uh, we have seven of these uh, on the Basque coast. Uh, these lintels that uh, portray Basque, Basque vessels uh, with a huge uh, scientific uh, relevance, and Brad can tell you about that. Uh, in Canada, uh, these lintels have really helped uh, to recreate uh, the rigging, uh, because logically we don't find remains, we don't normally re find the remains of the veils uh, and rigging uh, in the wrecks. So, uh, these uh, very 
true portrayals uh, of the ships uh, are in the Basque country and we should all know about that. Here we can see a galleon uh, from the 16th century uh, in Rent the town of Renteria in the Basque country. Those two are like a mixture between a cod and a dolphin, if you ask me. But still, people who live in Renteria now uh, don't know about uh, these, or in Saraus, you also have the uh, whaling chalupa from the 16th century uh, with the harpoon. And uh, a very well-known man in the town of Salaut, I'm not going to mention his name, uh, but talking to him recently, uh, he said, oh, I had no idea about that, I didn't know about it. It's a terrible shame, we have to put that right. Anyway, uh, this is where our wreck uh, was located in Rem Red Bay, which is like a bottleneck uh, for whales in that area. And that, this is what archaeologists found. Mano Izaguirre knows very well, because he was one of the archaeologists in the team uh, that was uh, a team that was working uh, in very harsh conditions. Well, more than harsh, terrifying, I would say, conditions. This is the diver uh, connected to a hose so that hot water can get to uh, their wetsuit and they can uh, continue uh, in that very cold water uh, during the part of the year when access is possible uh, because of ice. So this, this was a huge feat uh, in underwater archaeology. These brave people, very courageous people, didn't realize uh, this was going to be such a harsh task. Uh, iron nails uh, had been, were rusty, but they didn't realize how hard uh, it would be to also work uh, to remove uh, the tree, tree nails. Finally, this hydraulic system uh, was designed and uh, this hydraulic jack system uh, managed to cut through the T-nails, a very time-consuming task they were not expecting. So, uh, they finally uh, retrieved over 3,000 segments, uh, fantastic uh, preservation conditions uh, with all the uh, marks uh, from the saws and the tools that were used uh, by the carpenters. We have uh, a wealth of information uh, with the inventory, giving details about the nails, uh, uh, measurements, pictures, and also uh, some smaller and medium-sized models, uh, so archaeologists can recreate that puzzle on a small, at a smaller scale. After 30 years of research uh, at the Department of Archaeology, They've come to this and much more. This is just a summary of what interests us, which is the shape of the boat. Because we're speaking of a boat that generates a great deal of interest due to the fact that this is the first contact between the old world in Europe and America. It's the first industrial workers that go to America. Look at this. We go from being nothing to being the people that uh, um, generates the first industrial activity in America around whale hunting. It's a, the first who carried out that activity exclusively for many centuries up until uh, early 17th century, which is where when other countries start hunt, uh, whale hunting. This is a very uh, demanding and dangerous, dangerous activity, the most dangerous one that can be carried out in the sea, and uh, it was carried out by our ancestors. If that happened elsewhere, it would be on the front page of uh, many magazines. 
Right. This is why we started this project um, at a very small scale with um, the reconstruction of small boats. And as time went by, we're now making what you see here which is, at the end of the day, one of the main uh, question marks. How, how are, what do these ships look like? What do they actually look like? And here what we see is the guts of, of a ship that uh, was devoted to the transportation of thousands of uh, liters of whale oil in order to distribute uh, it in the European market. This is an extraordinary adventure that goes beyond anything else, uh, beyond any uh, film you can watch about uh, Moby Dick. This is the ship we're making. This is what we're uh, doing. It's a wonderful, a wonderful ship. You see the mock-up here. Um, initially, archaeologists were mainly focused on exactly this, on making this true uh, by means of a mock-up. But Robert Grenier um, told me many times we never could have imagined that nobody would like to build rebuild the uh, ship. We didn't even think about that. So for Robert and other researchers like Brad, this is like the second stage of the research, uh, the piece of research. Because one thing is to uh, make a mock-up and another very dif different thing would be to make the actual uh, ship uh, in, so that it can sail, which is what we want to achieve. Um, we want to sail the seas on this boat, and I will tell you more about it later on at the end of my presentation. Um, I also want to tell you why and how uh, we've uh, gone about this project, because this project didn't just come out of the blue. Uh, there are projects that are, are started spontaneously uh, out of nothing to uh, make a boat. We never worked in that way. We we started 21 years ago uh, in Albaola in a very uh, small workshop on the other uh, side of the river in San Pedro. We're now in San Juan and we were in very uh, small facilities um, that also were a museum that was open to the public. And that's how I met Xavier Ricedo amongst others and many of you, of course. And uh, we started by building small boats. Hmm. That was a long time ago. Um, we uh, worked in partnership with Parks Canada uh, to build this uh, boat, what we call a um, mother boat. Ama Chalupa in Basque. Um, this is one of the chalupas that were found associated to San Juan. And uh, this specifically was a great gift given to archaeologists uh, that decided to dismantle the now. And last year, when we got the last pieces, the keel, etc., they realized that underneath there was something else. And it was this chalupa that was underneath. It was uh, in good shape. Uh, we recovered almost all its structural elements and the missing parts on, ones, on the one side, since the boats are symmetrical, we can find them on the other side, so we can see, and we can say that we have a 16th century Basque Chalupa in perfect condition, thanks to the government of uh, Canada. This is exhibited in the uh, Red Bay Museum. This is one of its main uh, elements, and it's the oldest whale hunting chalupa uh, ever found around the globe. Uh, we, re we built a, a copy of this. There's uh, two of them, actually. The third one is still uh, in process. We left it unfinished on purpose so that we can observe the inside of the, the structure. And uh, um, it was a milestone for us. Um, I can tell you, because it helped us be more rigorous in what we've always tried to achieve, which is something that the Canadian government named, which is a commemorative integrity, um, more or less, right? Uh, which is a concept that was coined by Basque Canada, uh, Parks Canada, sorry, um, um, which means, uh, at 
the end of the day, we reach uh, that all object that we're going to reproduce and is based on a previous piece of research it needs to be loyal and faithful to the original piece. And this is a good chance for us to build this chalupa in a faithful way uh, to the original, to the actual chalupa. Each one of the parts has exactly the same shape as the original boat. Uh, and that was a challenge. Someone said that uh, when you build a second ship, it's not necessarily exactly the same as the first one. Uh, in this case, it was the opposite. We wanted to get exactly the same thing. We looked for the different pieces in the forest. They were, uh, um, we forged more than 200 nails uh, by hand. Uh, we painted it with tar, and that was a qualitative step to us. Because in the past, we, uh, we had built Basque boats based on drawings from the, the 18th and 19th centuries, but as many other um, shipbuilders for heritage purposes, we replaced some uh, original elements by modern materials that are not seen. For instance, the paint, black paint, uh, is very similar to tar, but it's not tar anyway. So in order to get tar, then we, need to, we needed to go to Finland and got it, right? Uh, it was uh, shipped to us at a very high price. I know this makes things uh, harder, and I know that many, uh, that other boats like this one have been used using uh, uh, new materials. And people tell me, why do you make your, your life so complicated and want to do the, exactly the same thing? Well, because we want to learn. It's like a, a role game, right? We want to do uh, something that is as close as possible to the uh, original thing. And this is the only way we know uh, to do things. I mean, we love it, we love to do things this way, and uh, you see, we, we reach, um, we take this to, to, to uh, the limit, and because we thought that maybe this chalupa could be taken to uh, Canada. We put it in a container, and we uh, made a fantastic voyage, because we sailed for two months, 2,000 kilometers from Quebec down to St. Lawrence, which was very hard due to the current. I think it's the fourth largest river in the world, which meant we had to adapt ourselves to the tides because we couldn't sail when there was a high tide because we were pushed backwards. So we needed to adapt ourselves to the tides and sail, I think, about... Uh, I, I don't know how many uh, kilometers, but every day we had to sail, at, well, at night, mostly. Um, we need to, needed to be very careful um, uh, in this type of voyages. Um, the space covered by the whalers is, is, very, is huge, it's very large. We uh, decided to go that way, but this coast is full of uh, Basque whalers, but there are many remains here as well. So, and now I remember that we decided to use this southern route because we wanted to cover this coast the western coast of uh, Newfoundland. If we'd uh, chosen the St. Lawrence River, we probably wouldn't have visited Newfoundland. And it was something we wanted to do, definitely. And, well, this was it. Um, we uh, sailed, uh, and we know that uh, galleons and naus went to very specific places, and chalupas would uh, cover uh, different uh, routes, but we know that, that they already they also sorry, made exploratory voyages like uh, the, uh, Indians and we know that these um, boats were abandoned by the Basque well, well, they, uh, they were given to the Indians in, uh, to pay for the, the, the partnership they had with them and the Indians then uh, used them and were very happy to have them because this was high tech for them and you see here a picture that we were sailing very fast. 
estela. You see, ¿Eh? uh, y bueno, yo the, y os navegando con velas de lino, uh, con eh, cuerdas de cáñamo, the, the trail, con un casco the way behind con, con uh, the brea, boat, you see, we have a tar uh, hull, eh, the tar came from y, Finland, y, but uh, uh, anyway, con las ropas que and we were dressed in the clothes de, de, de the, that, that were used at that time, clothes that you can see at the Red Bay Museum, there are some fragments of clothes that are very well preserved, we have we had the same shoes uh, made and well thanks to archaeology um, we um, managed to carry out this project and we felt many many things that you cannot feel when you read things on uh, books and uh, of course historians uh, you historians give us a great deal of information but this is more like living the thing uh, and uh, I guess that we felt like a uh, they used to feel in the past. I feel privileged because obviously uh, we had a phone, uh, we had support, uh, uh, we had to rescue the support boat we had. Uh, uh, anyhow, that's... Uh, that could be a long story. Um, and this is us roaring. This is a small scale project, really, uh, which is about uh, recovering a major um, heritage element. Um, but here we now have, uh, yes, uh, I, I could say that this has the same uh, value in terms of heritage as the Inao San Juan, which is uh, wonderful, of course. It's larger, but this small chalupa is also something that was uh, very important in the past. Here we have um, a very important um, element that belongs to our heritage. Um, some uh, institutions may not agree with us in, when it comes to um, acknowledging its importance. And, uh, as I told you about the, how uh, we uh, built uh, this chalupa, uh, well, we decided to use the same uh, process to build now San Juan. Again, uh, we built, uh, we're going to build the uh, ship without changing any of its pieces. Here you see uh, the keel, which is very particular. I uh, don't want to use many technical terms. Um, not to make this more difficult for translation, and I thank very much our interpreters for their good job. And I think that uh, Brad mentioned yesterday that the keel uh, is very particular, very special, and Eric uh, has mentioned this before. Normally you have a, a rectangular um, shaped uh, piece here. Beam. But this first beam, uh, the first plank is incorporated to the keel here, and you see it there? We're still working on it. There. Here, in the middle, it has a T shape, and as you go backwards or forwards, it becomes a Y section. All this part will be carved out later to reproduce exactly the same key. And now you may wonder why they would make the keel this way, because it's very hard, really, to uh, copy this piece. This part is very hard, it's very demanding, um, especially when you know that you can make a boat with a, a rectangular shape of keel, which is much easier to make. So it was very challenging, and I'm going to show you now some pictures uh, very quickly because I don't know how I'm doing for time. Yeah, not not very well. Well, for those of you who haven't uh, seen the whole process, uh, let me show you these pictures. Here you see how we we assembled all the frames. We use the one two three technique because we don't have a crane, so we just said one two three and. Uh, Oh, there we go. Um, we have women working on this project, uh, maybe not many, but some of them uh, are part of the, of the team. This is the, the space where we uh, are working. This is this part of the boat where the casks were um, loaded. This is the first deck. 
You see the people, the visitors there, we're very happy because we have uh, more and more visitors and this is what we want. This is what makes this project uh, special. It's one of our main goals which has to do with dissemination and their uh, uh, support, economic support is also important. Here we have this first deck uh, with the different elements you see there. Here we're going to have the mast with the kilson. And you have the albaola. Each deck will have a, uh, one albaola. One of the frames, we need to make a rebate there with a cover so that we don't have um, anything going under there that can um, um, harm the pump. Right, this is just for you to see what an albaola would be. Here we have the first deck. You see on the sides, we are still uh, working there on the second. Posteriormente, Compuesta siempre de diferentes piezas, on the second uh, eh, horn timber, and all the pieces are going to be assembled a la una, no? eh, at the same time. I mean, golpe, es así como se han this is the pues, way they used, used to build um, the ships, this is how the Hermione ship was built, época, uh, uh, the 18th century que, ship eh, was built like pieza, that. In this case, as they finish the deck, they continue uh, upwards uh, with this uh, whole timbers up until the end of the ship. And this is all about the uh, construction process. I'm going to skip fast. So this is, would be the second deck. And, well, uh, let me underscore here that the fact that uh, it is interesting to, to disseminate all this work. Um, sometimes our interest concentrates on, on uh, the, the fact that we were not able to launch uh, the ship. But in September 2015, the UNESCO gave us its support. And I want to highlight this because it's the first case in, in the world. This is the first reconstruction of a historical boat that has had support by UNESCO, which is the biggest recognition we could have. We are under the patronage of uh, UNESCO uh, and we are therefore engaged to reproducing and copying the ship um, in a faithful way. We are very proud to have UNESCO support, which is not um, uh, an economic subsidy, uh, unfortunately. We don't get any funding from them, but but uh, at least it gives us some recognition that we're very proud of. So, what for? What are we doing all this for? Well, we have the narrative, we have um, historical facts out there, and um, which is very important, of course. Uh, most of people coming to Albaola for the first time says, oh, I didn't know this was so. Well, and uh, together with, the, with this, with this transmission of, of this uh, narrative uh, in terms of, uh, in historical terms, we also count on very highly qualified professionals, because if we want uh, to keep our maritime heritage alive, we need to transmit knowledge and know-how. And here we have some students from uh, Aprendistegui School, this is the name of the school. It was created one year ago, um, some days ago. The second year students uh, started uh, their uh, school year. Uh, in the past, I had to go to the US to um, finish, uh, to carry out some studies. Um, but now we are trying to provide training uh, here in the Basque Country. And this is uh, essential, it's fundamental for us. Secondly, I'd like to say that we need uh, to go back to um, forest management. Um, currently, we get um, timber from uh, warehouses just to make uh, pieces of furniture. But if you're going to make a 16th century uh, ship, you don't have uh, the necessary uh, 
timber for that. So some decades ago, the last fishing boat was wooden fishing boat was made, and there were many trades in the past that were devoted to selecting. Uh, the uh, branches of the trees that would serve as, uh, that would be used for um, making the different pieces and parts of uh, a wooden ship. So now we need to get that back. Those uh, trades have now disappeared, and I think that currently we uh, um, have a challenge. Uh, and it's something very nice, and you learn a lot. You go uh, with uh, uh, for, uh, experts in forestry out there, you go to the forest, we work with uh, some experts in Navarre, for instance, uh, uh, oak tree forests from the valley in Sacana in Navarre have uh, provided us with uh, uh, about 300 uh, pieces. They were given to us uh, for free by the government of Navarre, and that is great, it's a great partnership. Here you, you have another example. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have any illustration here about it, but we're doing uh, well, the same thing we've done with the oak trees. Uh, uh, we are um, now using some fir trees for uh, coming from uh, the Salazar Valley in Irati, also in Navarre. Um, and this is this is a very nice um, teamwork. Um, it's good for us because we get material uh, without. Uh, paying for it, which is good, but we're also coming up with very interesting alliances and partnerships. We have, we now work in collaboration with the Forge uh, to get the nails. Ricardo Mellavilla is the last uh, blacksmith, which is an expert uh, uh, that uh, works hand in hand with us, and um, he's helping a lot. And in the town of Legaspi, oh, here you see the volunteers of Albaloa, Albaola. Sorry, who are here learning uh, some, new, some uh, techniques in Albaola because we're now um, making a new forge in um, Albaola. We have uh, now two uh, huge bellows, you see there at the back, from the 16th century, that are uh, exhibited in the Lili Palace in the town of Sestoa in Gibuzkoa, and uh, we're now uh, using them. We've, we copied those uh, bellows and they work very, very well. So this is a, an old trade that we are now getting back. As for uh, cordage, and we have here Ron coming from the Netherlands, uh, who's come he, over here for some time, who's teaching us the techniques that we use in the past. So we are recovering all these crafts. Now we have this machine uh, that has been uh, copied on the basis of the testimony of the last uh, cordage expert in, in, in this region. We're learning. It seems to be easy, but it's not that easy, really. And Rob told us that our machine is small, so we need a larger machine, apparently, so that we can uh, make larger ropes. We also have to make sales. Uh, like Eric, Eric Reid uh, just said, and here we uh, work in hand in hand with um, hemp producers in Brittany, because we know that in the 16th century they got this material, material from Brittany for the sales. They were hemp sales at the time, and we want to copy those exactly the same for San Juan uh, ship, and we want to make the sales ourselves. And here we have a picture of uh, some, well, someone I like very much. This is the tarring process. And I think this is a very important process. Uh, it's not been given, given much importance, but tar was fundamental for um, to for sealing the ships. Um, and this is a tar we're making um, by hand. Every year we, uh, we bring uh, this tar from 
from the province of Burgos, which is nearby the Basque Country. It's something we could have bought, because currently you have this star uh, produced industrially in the region of Segovia, but we, we've got, we've uh, decided to go uh, for a handcraft uh, process which has helped us establish new relationships uh, with uh, nearby provinces, in this case the province of Burgos, which we now consider to be very far away, but which is not that far away actually. And I'm sorry I was uh, that long. Um, I just want to finish by saying, and this is the last picture I brought, uh, let me tell you that the people from Burgos um, are very motivated by our project. This is a picture we took a couple of years ago, and they were so motivated that they said they were going to be bringing us a tour from Burgos, as you can see here, using oxens. And uh, this is a picture we took back then. Um, many people participated there, because behind this um, there were thousands, uh, hundreds of people uh, following this expedition. Uh, it's people that uh, were very motivated and who wanted to participate in the project um, with us. And uh, I think that's all for me. Um, this is our motivation. We want to um, provide importance and focus on this narrative and we want to make something that makes us all feel very proud. Um, we need to be proud of our past, we need to be proud of El Cano, this is very important, it shouldn't be uh, presented as, uh, as, bad at, uh, as uh, we presented it in, in the past, we don't, we don't, we really need to appreciate what he did, and uh, I think that's all for me, really, thank you very much.